thanks very much, Steve. And thank you, everyone, for uh, your welcome. So, um, as uh, Steve said, I'm here to talk about business in the community and our work that I did with them, along with my colleagues, uh, just before Christmas. Uh, just to get an idea, how many people heard Oliver's uh, com uh, presentation yesterday? Can I just see a show of hands? Just see. Okay, I might go through a little bit more detail about um, business in the community for those who uh, weren't able to see Oliver. So um, I always think when I see this picture, this is about engaging our um, our stakeholders, the business, um, using some engaging photography. I always think, well, sometimes I wonder what I'm doing in my job, but at least I'm not a man who has to perform as a metaphor. <laughs> So, about me, well, I started out actually as a civil engineer, um, as a sewer engineer, um, uh, le left the sewers, or at least designing them for uh, technical information management, and then um, ended up at IBM. I'll uh, leave you to fill in uh, the blanks there. So, um, this work came about through an IBM Impact Grant, which is to support uh, non-profit organizations, community organizations um, to develop, maybe access um, either software or consulting that um, those organizations may not have access to um, otherwise. I think um, in the past year, few years, IBM supported over 2,000 organizations in the last, um, across the world. Business in the Community was the uh, UK charity that we supported. They res uh, promote responsible business. Uh, they're part of the uh, Prince of Wales uh, Responsible Business Network, um, which gives them a lot of clout, a lot of uh, influence. And responsible business is about promoting uh, economic, social, and environmental sustainability in the communities where these um, businesses are engaged, where these communities are um, and where these businesses work so around training, around ensuring that they have a positive impact on their, um, on their community. And so uh, a really important thing is something which IBM have been involved in for many, many years. Now, the initial ask, um, I got a phone call um, from a colleague, um, a very senior, um, influential uh, stakeholder in IBM, in the consulting arm of the UK had asked us to work with business in the community. Um, now, it wasn't much of a statement of architecture work. It was, they want a digital strategy and they want a roadmap and they want it in six weeks and you're working part-time. Um, so, a statement of architecture work, it wasn't. Um, so, I really had to understand what this meant. What did this mean for the um, for the business themselves, for business in the community. So, and this is a slide which um, uh, Oliver shared yesterday. I engaged, in this first meeting we had with the team, I said, well, let's do hopes and fears. What, what do you really want? What do you hope you're going to get out of this? And what are you scared about? And it was a really interesting exercise because they talked about uh, some work that another organization had done for them and they had done a really detailed business strategy that was 120 slides at a 16 type font and it was full and there wasn't much breathing space. So loads of information, loads of detail, but quite challenging to engage their people with. So that was one of those key fears around failing to achieve the buy-in. They wanted something which they could use and they were part of and this conversation, which I really recommend you have, especially with people that maybe not been down this route before, is understand what they want, understand what they're going to get out of it, because this really helps us understand the format, the structure, the format um, of what was required. Um, and so, yeah, really, really useful. And it captured the team's desires to be involved right from the off. And I think that was, for me, um, really useful. So the process we went through, um, it's aligned to TOGAF, um, and we went as is first. And this was in part for the benefit of the 
uh, consultants, myself and my colleagues, uh, to understand the business. Now, we'd never worked in the charity sector before, and business in the community aren't a typical uh, charity. So we built uh, a business capability model um, using the IBM way of doing things, um, and we built uh, our architecture views. And this was actually the first time that business in the community had a holistic view of their own organization. So really quite, um, quite enlightening for them, and got us up to speed very quickly on what the organization was doing. We hosted a, a visioning workshop at our head office just the other side of the river. Um, this was really useful to engage a wider group. I think we had about 16 people in the room. We are using um, IBM design thinking techniques um, to understand the users, understand the customers. I'm going to touch on that um, later on as well. That workshop helped us to identify the capabilities, the changes that were required, and after some analysis, we um, brought these together into a set of initiatives, which are the white boxes on your screen, and across six themes. Channels, so the websites, their user journeys, their content management. Collaboration, so how do they engage their members? How do they engage um, their communities? Relationship management with their member organizations and with the um, local government and national government people that they, uh, they, they work with. Their knowledge management. Over the last 30 years, they've built an absolutely incredible um, set of um, reports of data. And I think similar to TOGAF, how you manage that information as an organization, how you give your, your members, your users access to it is a real challenge. And sometimes you can have more information than, than you know what to do with. Analytics, setting off uh, that journey to become a more data-driven business, data-driven organization. How would you start that? And finally, a lot of stuff going on in um, business and IT operations, as Oliver mentioned yesterday, around the discipline and governance that the business needed to, to start off. One of the things that came out of the workshop was that they were starting to realize that a lot of their IT problems were not totally the fault of IT. It was actually how the business used it, what governance, what discipline they had. So there was a lot of in, in that space. Developed the target architecture, which um, I was really um, infused by. That uh, Oliver's told me that it's been really, really useful to have what do they need on one screen in general terms. That they've been able to set up a common language with their across their organisation for people that may not be IT people, but they can at least go, okay, well, I know that I need to be in this space, or when we're talking about something, I understand that there are components to, for example, managing my knowledge. And then the digital center of excellence, something which we were very keen on um, from a point of view of promoting uh, good business uh, discipline around architecture, around their strategy, around their project delivery, and around their skills and capabilities, so they could become a more digitally uh, enabled organization. And that turned into our, um, our report and roadmap. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't seen myself any other uh, reports which makes the uh, TOGAF roadmap the centerfold of your magazine. It's a different kind of centerfold. Sorry. <laughs> and we had a final presentation, so um, made a uh, um, large format roadmap to that they could take around their organization. Uh, it's not quite my height. I, again, I missed another trick. Um, so what were my learning points? Um, this was the first time I'd, I guess, led uh, an enterprise architecture strategy project myself. Um, I've had a lot of guidance from Paul Homan, who's uh, down in the, in, the, in the audience, and I know many of you know him, but it's, I kind of felt this was the first time I've been let loose. Um, 
and it went very well. Um, so, but I actually have used Hogaf for the first time in Angular, perhaps without that uh, um, set, you know, really sitting, someone sitting alongside me. So I found that Togaf led to asking the valuable questions. The time we had was very limited, so we had to really focus on um, where where the value was. Where what did BITC require from us? What did we need to them to understand their business? And what we used when I used Togaf, I was able to use the, the content meta model uh, to say, okay, these are the kind of artifacts. I should be looking for. Um, this is what we need to need to develop, especially in the business architecture space, to understand how the organisation works. And maybe in some areas we can say, actually, we don't need that at this level because we're okay. We we understand enough from a point of view of an overarching IT strategy. Um, and that came into the second part, known when to apply the spirit of TOGAF rather than the letter. There was no desire of the organization at the time, and I think it's still true, to stand up an enterprise architecture capability. They have five uh, IT professionals who are keeping the lights on in the main. So to impose a, a too strict form of TOGAF, to require them to produce models or data that um, wasn't going to contribute to the strategy or to the roadmap um, would not have been appropriate. I found that this uh, project reinforced um, the importance of how we use models in, in two senses. Uh, first, to understand, when I um, came onto the project, I, I had no background in the charity sector and no understanding of how business in the community worked. So by building a, a component business model here, or maybe perhaps more familiar to you as a, a capability model, enabled to under, us to understand how the organization worked. What are the pain points in the organization? How is technology used? The, uh, the colorful diagram in the back is how the organization was using their Salesforce CRM platform. And it called out to them that they were using it in quite a disparate way. Um, maybe not taking advantage of all of the capability. And in some cases, they'd um, kind of half used it. And maybe that was quite, so that was really interesting for us. Um, we also looked at um, where activity had been. Now, I asked a question uh, yesterday in one of the breakout sessions around use of capability models and breaking out um, uh, sort of capabilities into a sort of a strategy, a management layer, and an operational layer. And what we found was that the organization, by doing that, the organization was very operational focused and had not been working strategically and not been thinking strategically for a year to 18 months. By breaking the capabilities out at that level, even though you kept them. So, for example, advisory strategy, advisory services management, and then the advisory delivery. By breaking it out, we found actually you've been doing a lot in delivery, but you haven't thought about your strategy for this for 18 months. What does that mean? What needs to change? The second part was model to communicate. Now, I'm going to show you a little animation, which was how we developed our business vision for the, di the digital vision for uh, business in the community. We started with an initial concept, and then we went through a load of iterations. Now, these iterations I'm showing you are just the ones that we kind of published, that we shared with the organization. But it was really key to um, develop this, talk to the business team, they, and they would talk to their community to understand what was working for them, what language was going to engage their stakeholders, some of whom were people we, we wouldn't get the chance to meet, either because the businesses uh, uh, had, to, had to focus, had to allocate a limited, could only allocate a limited amount of resources. So that was useful. There were other examples around the, the, capability, the, uh, the capability model, the themes, and um, the target architecture as well, producing a model that people could engage with, could understand. My third learning point is around the use of design thinking, which I'm not sure how many people are familiar with. It's about um, 
user-centered design. I actually did a little bit of a dig and a little search through uh, the old version, TOGAF 9.1, um, because no one had told me about 9.2. It doesn't mention um, end users or, or customers in any great detail. Uh, I wonder if that's missing a trick. Uh, design thinking takes um, a very much a people, a human um, focused approach to, to working out what we should be delivering. You can use this internally or externally. Um, and in our case, we used it to understand the people, the business in the community would be engaging with, uh, their needs, what were they looking for? Why would they go to business in, in the community? And I think for me, for me this was a really key um, driver to understanding what they actually needed to do and also help the business understand that while they had different campaigns, different um, focus areas, and they had different services that they provided, actually their users, their customers, had very similar needs. It didn't matter if they were a massive IBM sort of sized organization or a small medium enterprise um, in the north of England. They had These people they were engaging with had very similar time pressures, very similar motivators. So I think that by understanding our users, by uh, empathizing with their needs, we can really drive out a, um, a better architecture. Finally, I thought I'd just share a few uh, observations about the charity sector. I imagine for many of you, it's an area where you haven't worked either. Oliver mentioned this yesterday, the motivations of the stakeholders, the motivations of the people that work there. Many of them are truly engaged with the cause, and that might be for quite personal reasons. So I think it's important to be mindful of that, um, not something which is always true in the private sector, and in the public sector can vary. But I think in the third sector, yeah, truly people believe in the organization they're working with, and it's a personal thing. So you have to respect that. How they measure success? I think this was actually a question to Oliver yesterday. Similar to public sector, there's no focus on profit, so to speak. However, um, that doesn't mean that there's no way to measure success. It just needs, means you need to be a bit more, um, you have to be a bit more shared about it. You have to understand, you look for different ways to measure that, different KPIs. and. Um, I think TOGAF can help an organization like this tease out those drivers. A flip side to that, and I guess going back to the previous one about your stakeholders' motivations, is because there's no one single bottom line number to measure success, people can have different, uh, they can prioritize these measures uh, themselves. And so the measure for one person may not be the measure for the, uh, another. And I guess again, similar to the public sector, I'm working with some uh, public sector organizations myself, and different people have different uh, priorities. So that is um, something to manage uh, in, in TOGAF. The next point around the power of influential stakeholders. Now, I mentioned the uh, influential stakeholder right at the, on their logo. Um, similar to public sector, the, um, a stakeholder can, with, almost with the stroke of a pen, change the direction of the organization or create a new focus area. I think in the case of um, this organization, it's we need to go over here as, as well as do the other stuff. This is all great, but we need to add another area on. I think TOGAF can be really useful in this area by helping the organization understand what's different, what's new, how do we need to change, but also what's staying the same. What can we lift from the old way of doing things into this new way? I think that's really interesting, really useful. And I think for the organization, maybe they hadn't considered that uh, previously. When they started a new area, a new campaign area, they started afresh from a blank piece of paper. My final learning point around the charity sector is that they have the opportunity to be agenda setting in the way that maybe a private or a public sector organization can't be. Now, Oliver did say that a lot of the time they follow the action. Uh, they start
started after riots in, in here in London and in Liverpool in the 80s. But then they've, since then, they've developed into areas around uh, age discrimination and um, helping um, uh, senior uh, citizens who maybe don't want to give up working, helping them find work. And uh, they've worked a lot in the environment. But they can also set the agenda, set the standard for responsible businesses to engage these areas, engage in these matters, and provide guidance. So that's really useful. So in that TOGAF model, their target architecture, could, uh, especially around their vision, could be beyond what anyone else has been thinking about. So TOGAF can help by mapping a course, mapping a path. So my conclusions. TOGAF can be used to support projects in the charity sector. It's been used to support projects in many sectors, and um, I imagine it's been used to support other charity projects, but I've confirmed that for you. Um, second one, by applying the spirit of the framework, we could maximize the time, the value of the time we had available. Um, final point, the strategy of secured buy-in from stakeholders has proved to be a catalyst to change off the back of this strategy, uh, business in the community have secured the services of uh, a chief digital officer, seconded from Sky, a major UK company. Um, they have started thinking about digital, prioritising it. It's no longer the IT guys in the corner behind a cupboard. IT, digital, is front and centre of the way they can do things. And as uh, Oliver said, can help uh, enable these volunteers, these very motivated individuals, to do more and less admin, less fighting the machine. So, my final thanks to my report co-authors, Tim Alcock and Ernie, and uh, the BITC team. So Oliver's there, but also Danielle, Ku, Paul, and Pierre. And so with that, any questions? Take a seat. Thank you. <coughs> so, so thank you, thank you for that. It's good to hear. I know Oliver was a, a little concerned yesterday about uh, what you were going to say on the other side, but uh, you'd have been perfectly happy with that, I'm sure. Thank you. <coughs> but um, let's see. So you you, you talked a number uh, uh, a number of times about which was the subject of the talk. How TOGAF was useful in in various ways. Um, and uh, one of those was um, specifically towards the end. You talked about um, it was useful to help to help the ITC look at what was the same, what was different in potential new activities that they might want to take on. Can you say something about how you actually do that in practice? How how TOGAF helps that helps how you use it as a tool to help them do that. Well, so I I, I, th I think it was. We presented it as a as a potential way forward, something to perhaps include in their business planning. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it would be about um, a target first approach to uh, going through your architecture. Um, of course, it, BITC perhaps won't use it initially, but we've given them that seed, right. and I think it'd be very much a target first iteration. Where do we want to be? What's this? Uh, What's the business processes? What's the value stream going to look like? And then um, understanding the differences from where we were before. Right, right. I know Oliver talked yesterday um, with some pride, I think, about the, the target architecture. Actually gave them something to, um, uh, to show people and, and to look at. And you showed the, uh, the centerfold, uh, the, the roadmap there. Um, sometimes things like that in architecture aren't embraced readily and quickly by the the senior management was was that the case here or or did they did they get it <laughs> so I think I in both cases there was a, a nervousness on the team's part that we were trying to keep it engaging but at the same time you have something that's very technical uh, and very detailed to communicate so uh, I spent a lot of time around the layout around the presentation, trying to make it as engaging as possible. Um, the second one was introducing the concepts to them early. I showed you when we did the business, 
digital vision, how the iterations mm -hmm. developed. Um, that vision took about a month worth of elapsed time backwards and forwards right. through workshops. So there's a metaphor I've heard from, I think, from the, uh, from the Navy. Uh, they talk about a little bit of rudder far away from port is a lot better than a lot as you're going into the harbour. Right. And so I think that's the case here, is to engage the stakeholders, engage the leadership as early as possible, not be afraid for people to tear it down and build it back up again. Right. So uh, exactly to that point, um, at what point in the project was the word architecture first used? Ooh, that is a good one. <laughs> I think that we perhaps, um, we may have mentioned it in, in our first um, in, in our first meeting, in our first workshop, but it was very softly, it was sort of no, I don't want to say it was wrapped up in cotton wool, mm. but it was, we're going to take you through it, we're going to build it with you. Um, if you we're going to understand your concerns, un make sure you're comfortable with it. So I'd say we used the word architecture early, okay. um, but it wasn't, can we have your architecture, please? It was all in a non-threatening, don't worry about yeah. this kind of way. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, why were sticky notes with information from people's heads used as input for the strategy and not reports with the actual performance data that might be more predictive or prescriptive? So sticky notes are a um, key material in, the, in, in design thinking. Uh, it's not just an IBM thing. Um, many organizations across the world are using design thinking. And um, I, w I wonder if uh, BITC had the volume of data um, to guide where we wanted to go. Right. Also, um, did we have the time as, uh, as part-time project members to consume all that information, understand it, and make uh, valid uh, recommendations? The business strategy was evolving as we were engaging the team in developing the digital strategies. There wasn't something locked down we could refer to. And finally, I think it's really important, especially when our end users, our customers, our don't have a voice, that we create personas that we try to, as much as possible, empathize with them, mm -hmm. to understand their needs, understand their motivators, and build a picture of that. And the best way uh, we find is to use sticky notes, is to throw stuff on the wall and pull stuff down, work it out together in teams. Um, we then took those sticky notes. I think uh, some people may be referring to the where we had the capabilities and the initiatives on one side and the sticky notes on the other. There were maybe 70, 80 ideas. We analyzed them, we brought them together, went through a loop, engaged, went back to the project team and said, we're in this area. This is what we're thinking. Is this okay? Oh, you might have missed something or can you put a bit more emphasis in here? So I think sticky notes are uh, Great tool for helping great to prioritize things as well. Great tool for prioritization. Uh, one thing, actually, if, if I may, one thing I didn't talk about in the presentation there was um, how we prioritized the initiatives for the roadmap. Um, we had a big list of 20-something uh, initiatives, and we had a workshop with decision makers where we created a grid of uh, perceived value versus a feasibility, and went through each one by one to say, is this relative to the other more or less valuable, more or less feasible? And that really engaged these decision makers in a two and a half hour workshop to prioritize uh, 20 something initiatives. And, I, and I've been in workshop uh, in situations where it can take organization weeks to yeah, sure. prioritize 20 things. So to get it done in two hours, right. post its work. Right. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, how did you decide to use TOGAF in the first place? Was it a standard of BITC? Didn't sound like it was, but was it a standard of those, or was there some other driver to use it as opposed to other EA approaches? So uh, I think um, TOGAF was the approach that I used. It's something that I was familiar with, as I mentioned, 
Paul has been mentoring me uh, through uh, to build my knowledge, build my understanding of it. It provides a really good structure. Um, it gets past the fear of the blank page. Yeah. And it also enabled us to ensure we considered business information, application technology, even if the, in the final reckoning, information and technology were not uh, discussed to a great level of detail in the strategy. It was very much around the application architecture and around their business architecture. Right, right. but at least they were considered and they were phases that you didn't need to exactly. spend so much time on. Yeah, okay. Um, based on your experience at BITC, would you be interested in contributing a design thinking guide to the TOGAF <laughs> body of knowledge? Uh, <laughs> is, this, is this a volunteering or a volunteering? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. I, I definitely, um, whoever's <laughs> suggesting that, better not be Paul. Um, <laughs> it's not Paul, actually. It's no, not Paul, no. okay. Um, yeah, no, just come find me in the break yeah. and we can have a chat. Yeah, okay. Um, it must have been challenging to engage with the stakeholders quickly. Did you need to explain TOGAF to them, or was TOGAF a framework under the covers? I, I definitely a framework under the covers, and I think it was uh, Brian yesterday was talking about um, not selling business architecture to the C-suite. Mm. It was use it, mm. and when people go, this works, this is good, right. then you go, oh, ta-da, it's TOGAF, isn't it awesome? Yeah. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, this is about tools. Were all of the BITC models developed in PowerPoint, or are some of them in another tool? Um, PowerPoint and Excel. Right. Um, I, I personally don't have experience of using um, an Archimate, uh, a Spark CA. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just size of project. Um, they're not that complicated. <laughs> right. Okay. Those interested in tools, there are people out in the uh, exhibition area who would love to talk to you about them, about them more. Um, how frequently do you think the BITC models and roadmap will need to be updated? I think that if they come back to their roadmap in two, three years, as I actually talked to Oliver about this uh, recently, um, I think that would work. They have an annual planning cycle. Um, the roadmap is a three to five year roadmap. One of the key things is we didn't lock down on um, these dates in the roadmap. We talked about phases um, because you're a charity. And, and to be honest, many organizations will struggle to hit a specific date and you go, oh, my massive one and a half meter size, 1.6 meter roadmap is now out of date. I don't think that's, that's crucial. The answer to the question is, give them a couple of years, I think they'll be ready to refresh it. It may not be quite so. D see what's changed. Mm -hmm. See what's stayed the same. Yeah, yeah. Give them a chance to live with it for a while. And exactly. See how useful it is. Okay. Um, question that that comes up quite a lot about um, architecture and uh, or pace. Let's say agility. Sure. Um, you know, uh, agile approaches to architecture. You you said at the beginning this was. Uh, six weeks, you've got, they want it in six weeks and it's uh, and you're part time. Annual part -time. <laughs> so clearly, um, clearly this wasn't a long drawn out, uh, long drawn out no. process. So can you say a bit more about um, uh, whether it was easy, difficult or, or anything else to do it in that kind of time frame? What was it? So I think the, the time pressures were very much, it's a, it's a grant, it's a, a corporate social responsibility thing. Mm -hmm. um, I have billable um, commitments, as many of us do. Um, the, I, th I think by having TOGAF as that, you know, we didn't ha never had a blank page. You always said, well, I, I need to understand the business architecture. I want to just lift the covers on information, on application technology. OK, we need to loop around and go more detailed in there, in these spaces. Then. Um, but always having an idea that it was only going to be six weeks, so therefore I need to have these milestones. Right. Focus the mind right. because of the structure that, uh, right. that it provided. Right. And knowing what you have to get through with the phases provides you with the yeah. and, uh, and another a check a as well. Yeah. And th that's the spirit rather than the letter. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, 
last question that is so far, unless one comes in. Um, you talked about Telegraph allowing you to ask valuable questions. Um, in a similar way, we, we often hear uh, a big value of it is it provides a common language for people who are working on the project. Was, was that the case here? Was that another of its values? Or I think that it, um, it may, may be the, the common language but, um, in the project team, which yeah. just by the nature of consultancy hadn't worked together before. Mm -hmm. But we, we didn't have TOGAF 9.1 stacked up in our project room. Sure. Um, I, th I think it was more that common language when we came to um, the uh, around the architecture, around na naming conventions, mm -hmm. and I think that came from uh, Tim, who was our uh, very experienced technical architect, was able to refer to things in a generic way, right. which is quite important because now business in the community can say, "We want one of them." It's not we right. want a sales force; it's we right. want a CRM. Right, that kind allows of thing. you to describe it as well. Yes. Okay. okay. James, we're going to leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, James Conway.